We're so excited to have you all here. My name is Tammy Fleming. I am one of the women on this call from the women's service team, but we all want to welcome you. There's a number of regional family chair women here and just women all around the world, India, Hawaii, Africa, North America, South America, Europe. It's fantastic. United Kingdom, Yay. welcome. <laughs> So I have the honor of introducing to us our guest speaker. I'm so excited about mm -hmm. this time. Dr. Jillian Hall has a long, long list of letters behind her name, all sorts of credentials, which I cannot decipher. Jill graduated from the London Hospital Medical College, University of London in 1989 as a medical doctor. And she did her junior doctor training in hospitals in and around East London. In 1994, Jill completed her specialty training, and she's been working for the last 19 years as a general practitioner, which is a family medicine physician, at her practice in the borough of Newham in East London, serving one of the most diverse and deprived communities in the UK. Jill is uh, an incredible sister. She's known in the East London Church of Christ as Dr. Jill, and we're so lucky to have her today. She has been fortunate enough during her life and career to have had many adventures and exciting experiences, which is why we've chosen her and so glad she accepted and agreed to come and speak to us on the topic of balancing life in hard times. She has faced real life death situations at other times, very painful personal issues such as infertility, failed IVF treatments, miscarriages, and several very challenging family situations, which she'll probably tell us about. For example, and she'll tell us more about this, but I just wanna make sure we get the overview because it's so good. Jill was working on a research project at the sickle cell unit in Kingston, Jamaica, when the full force of Hurricane Gilbert hit the island in 1988. In 1993, she worked as an expedition doctor in Zimbabwe and Namibia, traveling to, into other countries in East Africa with the British charity Raleigh International. I hope she'll tell us about the time there was a gunman in the camp today. We'll hear about that. It was in Africa that she developed a love for work in the developing world and following another brush with death, seriously started thinking about God. Soon after returning to London, she was invited to attend a service with the East London Church of Christ and Jill was baptized in April, 1994. In 1995, just as a young Christian, she visited several hope programs in India and was completely inspired by the work hope was doing as many of us have been. Later that year, she studied for a diploma in tropical diseases at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And in 1996, she had the privilege of joining the original international medical team that started the Sihanouk Hospital Center of Hope Phnom Penh, Cambodia, which as you well know is Hope's flagship project program. Jill was put in charge of developing their HIV AIDS work and was made director of an amazing department as God blessed that work incredibly. That's where she met her husband, Dr. Freddy Cruz, who was also part of the HOPE medical team from Manila, Philippines and Cambodia. And they were married in Phnom Penh, Cambodia in 1999 and returned to live in London in 2000 for further adventures. So, Dr. Jill Hall, everyone. Well, oh my goodness. Good evening, everybody. Mm. Oh, good morning. Um, it's 6 p.m. here in London, England. And greetings from London. I, I just feel so excited i felt very nervous um but now I, I feel excited just to see faces from all around the world i feel completely humbled i must say i feel completely privileged to have been asked to do this um my thanks have to go to helen langendan who who i think put my name forward um and thanks so much to tammy and Sirikit and jillian my new friends who have been so great so encouraging and just help, all the help with the techie side of it um i hope ladies that you're all well i know we're all going through a, a strange time right now um hope you've all got a, a a drink with you, a cup of coffee or a tea. I've got my mug here. It says, keep calm and carry on. It's a very British motto. And here in Britain, we're, we're supposed to be renowned for our resilience and strength through hard times. I, I wonder sometimes if we are, but that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So the good old British flag, the, the uh, Union Jack and our motto, keep calm and carry on, as I, as I say. Um, so you're probably familiar with this iconic London landmark and I've, it's obviously Tower Bridge going across the River Thames 
And I particularly chose this one because I'm in East London. And just to sort of orientate us a bit, um, so you're here with me now in East London, welcome. And uh, you'll see a bit of the city through the tower there, up through the, the bridge there, that's the famous Gherkin. So that's the sort of east part of the city, mainly offices and so forth. Well, I'm further east than that. This, this is right on the edge of the city on the east side. And going out further east is, is um, where I live. And I also work in East London. You may be familiar with this. It looks a bit like a building site, which I think it was at this point. Um, but this is in Newham, where Tammy mentioned I, I work in Newham, a poor, very poor London borough. And because of that, it was chosen to be the site of the 2012 Olympics. And that's probably really the only reason you would want to come to Newham. Um, but uh, it was bringing money, of course, and investment into a part of London that desperately needed it. I think sadly um, patients in my practice didn't benefit too much from the rejuvenation program but um, you know that lo and behold we've got it there and uh, it has done many good things for, for the poor part of London. So this isn't a very exciting looking building but it's where I work, it's my practice, my family practice in Newham in a place called East Ham um, and as I mentioned Newham is a very poor very deprived part of London. We, we look after a very ethnically diverse group of people. We have many refugees and asylum seekers, um, a lot of um, general health problems, of course, um, but associated with lower socioeconomic classes. So a lot of heart disease and diabetes and so on. We also look after three nursing homes and homes that look after people with mental health problems and learning difficulties, learning disabilities. And so um, we have a very needy population. And as a result, sadly, we're the hardest hit during this COVID pandemic in the whole of London and in fact the whole of the UK. Our, our numbers are bigger here than, than anywhere else. Um, wow. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so this is my family. So um, my husband, Ferdy, uh, from the Philippines, Manila. Um, my daughter, Maddie, who's 13, and Jamie, who's nine. So um, just a little note on how I became a Christian. As Tammy mentioned, it was in 1994. And I think you wanted to hear a bit more about the shooting. Uh, well, I was in Africa at the time as an expedition doctor. And this particular evening, we were in a campsite in Malawi. And there was a gunman that was going rampage uh, in, the, in, in the camp, just randomly shooting his gun. And I found a diary from that time where I'd written, clearly he was shouting, someone is going to die. Um, you know, I saw my life flash in front of me. I was just in a little tent and obviously that wouldn't protect me from bullets. Um, and all I could remember, there'd been a shooting in the state or, States around about that time where a gunman had gone crazy and just shot everyone in the camp. So that was the image in my mind. And I prayed. I prayed really hard, as you do in those situations, that God would save me and I'd get out alive. And, and if he did, I promise God I will find a church. And um, of course I did get out alive and you know, a few months later I did return to London. And of course, somebody invited me to the East London church, someone on the street. And of, of course, a little voice in my head said, this is it, you have to go. And I knew I had to go because of my prayer. And um, so the rest, as they say, is history. So that's how I first uh, sought God and how I was invited. And I'm so glad. <laughs> So I think um, this is us ladies. Um, I did stretch the diagram out a little bit because I felt, felt that made it more realistic. But isn't this <laughs> women a bit stretched but trying to spin all totally. our plates without dropping any? Um, I have to say I don't, I certainly don't consider myself an expert on having a perfectly balanced life. But especially in hard times, I think knowing our priorities is so important not try to cram every activity we can into the day, expecting the unexpected. And I do think this recent pandemic was unexpected. Um, oh my goodness, yes. Keeping a positive attitude, a positive mental attitude obviously helps. But of course, that can be hard enough when times are going well, can't it? What about during our hard times? And, you know, at this point, I just wanted to acknowledge that I realise that all of you ladies have or are facing trials, difficulties, maybe it's health challenges or physical pain, loss, regardless of COVID. But of course, especially during this time, it's an added pressure and stress. Some of you are probably facing complete isolation right now and loneliness and having to shield. 
I actually prayed for each of you today just to have a little bit of encouragement or a little bit of hope from what God's put on my heart to share. I think one of the hardest things for us to live with is uncertainty. Um, that mm. wanting to be in control, all the what ifs. What if I never get married? What if I fail my exams? What if I can't have children? What if I don't get better? What if this horrible situation I'm in doesn't get better? Or what if it gets worse? And you know, for some of us, we may not know the answers this side of heaven. I've also been through some difficult times. Um, Tammy's listed them. Um, but of course, we're told to go, we need to go through these times in order to grow in our character and in perseverance. Um, yes, in 1988, I was studying at the Sickle Cell Unit in Kingston, Jamaica, when Hurricane Gilbert devastated the whole country. I, fi I failed my final year medical exams first time around. That really hurt, both financially and emotionally. I was with a group held under armed guard in Uganda. I was witness to dead bodies floating in a river and tear gas riots in Rwanda at the start of their civil war. As I mentioned, I was in a campsite in Malawi during a shooting. I lived and worked for a coup in Cambodia. I experienced years of infertility, investigations, failed treatments, miscarriages. I had a baby that had significant health issues. You had to visit the paediatrician, a geneticist, an orthopaedic surgeon, an ophthalmologist, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, um, and a community paediatrician. I had um, serious, my, my husband had serious work challenges that we had to face as a family. We have a child with ADHD and challenging behaviours due to early life trauma. And currently I'm working full time as a frontline healthcare worker during the COVID pandemic. All of these situations have taught me lessons that I now realize I'm applying and using in my current challenging situations. They've particularly helped me learn a lot about perseverance. Early on this year, even before the full extent of what was happening hit the news, as doctors, we were obviously being deluged with so much information, too much information sometimes, often it was conflicting. We had urgent meetings, late night webinars, hundreds of messages coming through every day on my WhatsApp groups. Anxious patients, patients getting sick, losing our patients, patients in our nursing homes dying at a great rate, as I'm sure you've all been hearing in the news. We were worried about not getting enough PPE or the right PPE, that's personal protective equipment. Here's me and my PPE at work. <laughs> um, we had our staff starting to get sick. One of my GP partners in Newham um, became very unwell. I had to get him admitted to hospital. One of our new Newham GP colleagues died. There was a lot of feelings of fear, of apprehension, of anxiety, uncertainty about what's going to happen. And then I realized I was having some funny feelings in my chest, like palpitations or a little bit of discomfort and finding it a little bit hard to breathe. And I recognized I was beginning to experience symptoms of anxiety. At that time, I started to have sort of flashbacks in my mind, like deja vu to a previous time in my life when, when I'd been living and working in Cambodia. That was a very cool, difficult time as well. And going through this now helped me reflect back on that time and think about how did we focus? What did we do? Um, how did we focus on what was important? How did we manage our fears? How did we balance life? Um, so after being in Africa, I'd really developed a longing to work in a developing country. And my dream, as you can probably guess, was to go back to Africa. One country I'd heard of during my tropical medicine training was Cambodia, and I really didn't want to go there. It sounded far too scary. Um, but I actually was praying for a heart that was willing to go anywhere that God wanted me to be. Even if that meant staying in London, actually. I, I just wanted to be open to God's will. In 95, I visited the Hope Projects in India. I met Helen and Mohan Nanjindan. I was completely inspired by their work. And the following year, 96, I had a call from Mohan offering me a job. Now, I thought he was going to say to go to India, um, but it was actually to go to Cambodia. Um, and at that point, I realized God has a sense of humor. And because of my prayer, to go anywhere, to have that willingness, I knew I had to go and that I would go. So a little bit about Cambodia, which you, you may or may not know where it is. It's a small country, it's a beautiful country, um, has a population now of about 16 million, 
And as you can see on this map, it's bordered by um, Thailand and Laos and Vietnam. So it's in Southeast Asia. And this is a picture of the famous Angkor Wat temples. Um, it's pretty much the main reason people go to Cambodia as tourists to, to visit these. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd show that. You may have seen those. And the next uh, picture, please. And this is the hospital as it was when we first were there. It's obviously changed a lot since then because that was 24 years ago. Um, but this, is, this was it, the Sihanouk Hospital Centre of Hope. I was one of an international team of medical professionals that were asked to help set up and manage and support the hospital. Um, the mission of the hospital was to provide free quality healthcare for the poor. So I went out with Hope Worldwide as part of this medical mission team. And my responsibilities initially uh, were with um, Dr. Ferdy uh, to help set up the emergency room. Um, and I was also asked, could I do something about the HIV AIDS problem for the hospital? And by the way, there's no money for that. That's a whole nother story, but we saw God's miracles, let me, let me say, and that the HIV work just grew and grew and grew. Um, thanks to the church and our wonderful Cambodian volunteers. But a bit about the reason why we were asked to go to Cambodia. It has a very traumatic history. You may be familiar with the 1984 film, The Killing Fields. Between the years of 75 and 79, there was a, a very um, brutal genocidal regime. There was an extreme communist leader, Pol Pot, and his army, the Khmer Rouge. Pol Pot had this ideal of bringing the whole population back to year zero, of starting a whole new population of peasants, and everyone would cultivate the land and live off the land. To do that, he systematically killed the educated classes. He destroyed the complete infrastructure of the country. So that include hospitals, schools, libraries, museums, even the um, temples or religious institutions, everything was destroyed. Um, if you were a foreigner living in the country, you were killed. If, you were, if, if they thought you were educated, so even wearing glasses or if you could read a map, you would be killed. A quarter of the population died, either from starvation, execution or illness. In 1979, the Vietnamese invaded and liberated the country. And in 93, the United Nations backed elections saw two prime ministers put into power. Well, that was never going to work. Um, Prince Ranarig, the king's son, was the first prime minister and second prime minister Hun Sen, who actually was a f former Khmer Rouge soldier himself, was the second prime minister. When we arrived in 96, as you can imagine, the country was very unstable. There was a lot of political tension. There were constant rumors on a regular basis that a coup d'etat was going to take place. They were so frequent, these rumors, that in fact, the weekend it happened in July 97, we were completely caught off guard. And it was terrifying. We found ourselves literally in the middle of a war. There were tanks on the streets, gunfire, bombs, the house I was in at the time was literally shaking from the bombs that were going off in the streets around us. And we just prayed. I remember being on my knees with my sisters there, just, just praying for God to, to save us and keep us safe. We were terrified. Our staff, our Cambodian staff, who obviously were more familiar with the terrors of the, of the genocide, were absolutely so fearful that it may become another killing field. I actually found my diary from that time and um, I just took a little bit from it, which I thought I'd just read to you, if that's okay. Um, 6th of July, 1997. Since we've arrived in Phnom Penh last year, there's been a constant underlying feeling of tension in the city. Acts of violence erupting from nowhere and senseless killings for a few dollars or at most a moto. On the 30th of March, there was a vicious grenade attack on a peaceful anti-corruption march. About 30 people were killed. But it's not all been guns, bombs and fighting in the last few weeks. It's been intense at the hospital too. Working hard in intense heat, sometimes more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Writing lectures, teaching, working in the ER, visiting and supporting patients at the other hospitals, encouraging the volunteers with our outreach work with the HIV AIDS patients. We've been busy. Yesterday, Hun Sen's troops began full-scale fighting with Prince Ranarid's troops. This is now officially a coup d'etat. Hun Sen will now not stop until he has full control. Either Ranarid must surrender or dot, dot, dot. 
Fighting has continued with mortar and bomb blasts and, ma and machine gun fire being heard at various locations throughout the city. Monday, 7th of July. We opened the hospital today, but it was pretty scary. There were soldiers and fighting going on very close to the hospital. We could hear bombs and gunfire all day. It was so surreal. I kept feeling like I'm in a dream. I feel so much that this is why we are here, for the hospital. I want to help in whatever way I can, even though I'm not trained in trauma. Also, I really believe God will protect us. Why would he have a church, a hospital and a hope team here if we were all to be killed? I felt really sad as we treated a family this afternoon for shrapnel wounds. I tended to the little eight-year-old girl who was very traumatized. Her father had been holding her one-year-old brother in his arms when the baby was shot and killed. Can you imagine the trauma for that little girl? Unbelievable. Seeing her baby brother murdered. This week I've really been thinking about her father, how he must have felt. The only reason he'd survived was because his own baby had shielded him from the bullet. 8th of July 2020. Thank God for his word. Thank God for his love for us and his grace. I am a wretch. I feel so weak, so anxious, so fearful, but God continues to encourage me and to give me a strength that is not my own. I know that God wanted me at the hospital this morning. I know that he wants me to show a faith and strength of character that I've never known before. Not just for my sake, but for my brothers and sisters, our non-Christian staff, and for the three patients who are here with us. And there was an incident that morning while we were in the hospital. Um, um, we, were, we were all working and in front of the hospital, the soldiers with guns were running and a tank was coming through and we didn't know what was going to happen. And we just knew we had to hide. And we took our staff and our patients that were with us down into the basement of the hospital. And we prayed. And, and I just wanted to share this scripture from Isaiah because that morning before any of that had happened, I turned in my Bible to Isaiah 50 and 51 and I didn't really know at the time why. And then it all made sense during this incident because Isaiah here talks just about these two chapters. They, they, they talk about, God talks about his deliverance and, you know, protection and how we just need to look to the heavens. And, and you know, he, he's just going to wipe out our enemies. And wow, it was so powerful for us at that time. And, you know, I shared it with Ferdy. And uh, while we were down in the, the basement, he then opened the Bible and shared it with all our staff. And our Cambodian brother, one of the other Cambodian doctors, he read it in Khmer to the Cambodians. There were a couple of Buddhist um, uh, friends among us who were, who were chanting their Buddhist chants. We were all in fear, as you can imagine. But for the Christians, it was an intense time together, a time that we were really together, really with God. And um, just, I think, um, yeah, a turning point of, of, for my faith, I think. I'll go back just quickly to my diary. Um, an evacuation plane was arranged to take anyone who wants to leave the city. It was a night of heart searching for all of us. It would be the last plane out. The embassies and the UK Foreign Office are advising people to leave. All other NGOs are leaving. We were challenged to count the cost of being injured or even killed. And I spent the night on the roof of our villa, wrestling in prayer and reading scriptures with my dear friend Angela. There was no doubt in my, our minds we would be staying. It was it was intense. It, that coming week we had early morning meetings um, in one of the villas. At 6 a.m. we'd get together our, our hope leader at the time, Mark Ramijan. I, I don't know if any of you may know him, and his wife Patsy, they were leading our group. But Mark would have he had a big map up on the wall of Cambodia with little pins that he would put in each day, just marking the various exits out of Cambodia. And every day another exit route would be cut off till finally there were no exit routes. And uh, the only way out would have been by helicopter. So it was pretty intense, but we were, we were there together in this and we were faithful and you know, we'd made our decisions. We'd signed our waivers that Hope would not be responsible should anything happen. Uh, we'd written our final letters home to our families Thankfully, we didn't need to use them, of course. Uh, but it was just, again, that uncertainty. We did not know what would happen. 12th July, well, we made it through the week. It's definitely been exciting, stressful, faith building and challenging and all those big words. I don't think I've ever felt so tense and had to rely on faith in God so much as this week. I think what's helping me 
is seeing what an impact we're having on the city, on the church, and all our hospital staff. It's been good to see more of our patients coming back and seeing we are still able to help people, that we're needed and we're still able to function. You know, reading my diary, the feelings I had at that time, the fear, the tension, the anxiety, the uncertainty of what would happen, the soldiers, the tanks, the war, the real visible enemy, it was kind of similar to the feelings I've had recently to the invisible enemy, the coronavirus. You know, the fear of becoming infected myself or bringing it home to my family. This became very more real when I lost my dear aunt in her nursing home just recently. We, we had her funeral yesterday. And I know many of you would have lost family or friends during this time. And, and you know, we've lost tens of thousands here in, in the UK. I know it's far more in America. I know it's a, a really hard time. I thought back to what had helped me during my time in Cambodia. And as you heard, we prayed. We prayed hard. We held on to the word of God. We increased our connections with the Cambodian disciples in the church and with each other in the international team. We were honest and open with each other, with our raw emotions, and we wrestled with our feelings and with God. We learned to totally rely on God. We chose not to focus on the bombs and the negative press coverage. We just prayed more on our knees, sharing and praying together and fasting. And we looked at the bigger picture. We looked at the hospital. We wanted to help the hospital, our patients, the church. You know, it would have been so easy to have been completely overwhelmed by my own fear and anxiety. And the staff trusted us and respected us and loved us so much more because we'd not left them during the coup. They had expected us to leave when all the other NGOs left. Those friendships we have now will live forever um, because they were built on <laughs> real events and, and real life stuff that we only had each other to cling to and God and, and going through things like that, I think we build forever friendships. We saw many um, miracles. I saw God's blessings. Um, I personally saw God work powerfully and protectively and I saw God deliver us. There were many baptisms following that. Many doctors, nurses, support staff, including Sachia, my translator, and two lovely lady doctors, Drs. Rin and Sira. The hospital grew and developed, more staff joined us, and, and there were many more baptisms that followed. And for me, a personal blessing, you know, I told you I was asked to develop the HIV AIDS department with no money. But I, I found that through the volunteers from the church, we, we just gave so much love that the, the, the uh, department just grew. Um, we flourished. It became a thriving ministry within the church. Um, our volunteer group, the home care program that we developed and the support group became a model for the country and has been shared about internationally. And I was asked to speak at several international conferences. Then in 1998, my biggest blessing of all was that Ferdy and I started dating. We were married in Phnom Penh on May the 29th, 1999. Yes, today is our wedding anniversary. This is one of my favorite go-to scriptures. Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. And you can imagine during that time in Cambodia, as of now, this is a, a scripture that gives me so much peace. And uh, I, just, I just sit and meditate on it. Um, I know you're all not familiar with it, um, but I just wanted to share that one. Since returning to London in 2000, we have of course gone through other diff very difficult times. We've faced different kinds of trials. And again, through each one, I've learned to look for God's hand in the trial and learn the lessons he wants me to learn and the character weaknesses I need to keep working on. And so to now, of course, and the very difficult challenge that uniquely in our lifetime, the whole world is experiencing. You know, during this pandemic, we often hear people say, we're all in the same boat, but I don't believe we are. We're in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some boats are strong and sturdy and well-balanced. Others have holes, maybe many holes. Maybe they're in very bad need of repair. Some are weak, almost sinking. Some are being tossed about on the waves. What are your boats like? Are you repairing the holes? Who's helping you to repair the holes? What are you going to do to make your boat sturdy to face the next storm that will inevitably come? 
are you so focused on the waves, the wind, the depth of the sea, of your storm, that you're neglecting the state of your boat? Are you more concerned about the height of the waves than making your boat more secure? You need to focus on taking care of your boat or you won't survive the storm. And have you remembered that Jesus is right there in your boat? And he always will be, and he was always there, helping us, guiding us, delivering us, watching over us, listening to us, comforting us, carrying us. With Jesus there, you will be fine, whatever your storm, as the disciples were when they were out on the lake. And remember, he promised us in John 16, verse 33, that although we will have troubles in this world, he has overcome the world, and that should bring us all so much comfort. I love this slide. I thought I must share it with you. I came across it. Never be afraid of the storm you find yourself in. Jesus is on your boat. He will calm your storm with just one word. Trust him. Yeah, for me, keeping my boat balanced is about striving to put in place the lessons I've learned in the past. It's about looking back and remembering how I've seen God work powerfully in my life. Not always as I'd hoped or imagined, but actually always more than I had hoped or imagined. And that gives me hope and faith that God has a plan. God always has a plan. He always works for the good of those who love him, Romans 8, 28. So I'm trying to keep my thoughts and my eyes fixed on Jesus, as it tells us to in Hebrews 3, verse 1 and 12, verse 2. Taking time to remember that God is in control and I just need to let him be in control. Psalm 46 verse 10, which I've already shared. It's also important to stay connected with our friends, our family. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly trying to do that. Um, even though I, I'm not great at IT, so I'm totally grateful to Tony for helping me today. <laughs> Praying and fasting. You know, we have a weekly prayer chain for the church and I, you know, being part of that, being connected that way thinking of and trying to help and encourage others around us. So right now with the COVID pandemic, the wind and the waves for me were, as I shared, too much information coming at me, sometimes conflicting information from medical peers via WhatsApp, sometimes false news, watching too many news updates, the anxiety I could feel from my GP colleagues and my practice team, not knowing where the next toilet roll was coming from. That was quite worrying for a while, ladies, wasn't it? <laughs> to help steady my boat, I'm ensuring good times with God. I have my memory go-to scriptures, reflecting back on past experiences and adventures with God, making special times with my family. And little Jamie learned to ride his bike this week. That's a really precious memory that uh, from, we will remember from this pandemic. <laughs> And of course, it's our anniversary tonight, so hopefully we'll have a special meal together. Not so regular connection with my family group and other Christian friends, prayer times, family group fun times, Bible studies, one-on-one -on -one times. All of this can be done through, obviously, our, our IT connections, which is, is amazing, which obviously we can take forward with us as a positive thing from this time. And looking at the bigger picture, what impact can I have on those around me during the pandemic? How can I encourage my work colleagues and people in the community. Well, I decided I would go into work. A lot of my colleagues are working remotely, doing their telephone consultations and video consultations. I still, of course, do a lot of that, but I do it from my practice, where I can be around the team and give them moral support and, and be someone there who can perhaps calm them a little or encourage them. I, am, I feel so grateful that my manager, practice manager, sees me as someone who's strong and calm, and I'm glad about that. Um, helping our elderly neighbours and my elderly parents with shopping. Um, I set up a WhatsApp group for our street. And I've connected people who have lived on this street, can you believe it, 40 years and haven't spoken to their neighbours. So we've created a community. And on VE Day, which um, you may not, have, may not be so familiar with in America, but Victor uh, Victory in Europe Day, the end of the war, we had a big celebration. It was 75 years this year. So we had a front garden party where everyone came into their front gardens and we celebrated it together. I've been involved in Bible studies. More than anything, I'm learning to take one day at a time all over again. As it tells us to in Matthew 6, 33. 
Jesus knew we'd be overwhelmed if we tried to do more than take one day at a time. I'm sure that's why he shared that with us. And trying not to predict the outcome of a pandemic, one step at a time. And practically, and also very importantly, we need to think of ways to help our mental and physical health because we can't achieve all we want to or could do for God if we don't look after our physical bodies and our mental health. So I, I've come up with a mnemonic. I know we all love mnemonics. <laughs> Balance. So I, I know that you know all of these. You're, you're trying to put all of these into practice. But um, certainly, you know, please carry on doing that. Obviously, the belief in God, the trusting, the reading our Bibles and praying, obviously we're doing that. But just thinking physically a little bit, do please make sure you're eating healthily, exercise regularly. It does make you feel better. There's a lot of science behind exercise. Um, in fact, after about 10 weeks of three times a week, 45 minutes, um, it's as effective as having an antidepressant medication. So we do need to do that. Um, a couple of fun ones here I've put on which can help our mental health. The apple technique for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, I, I have put um, a document that you, will teach you more, but just very briefly, it's how, how we deal with negative thoughts or uncertainty. So when we get those negative thoughts coming in, we acknowledge them. We pause, we don't react, then we push them away. We let them go. You can even picture it in your mind in a bubble or a balloon just floating away. And then we explore the moment. And remember that right here, right now, in this moment, I'm fine. And that thought I'm having isn't a fact. It's just a thought. Not everything we think and feel are facts. We all know that. But it, in that moment when you're anxious or worried, it can be hard. So it, it's a good technique to maybe practice. Um, and with that also in mind, uh, our C for connection, obviously with that, that's important, connecting with one another. Also C for chocolate. Dark chocolate, um, it, it has a lot of actually very positive health benefits, um, but there's a fun um, mindfulness technique uh, using a piece of chocolate. And again, I've, I've included a document which hopefully can be circulated on, on how we use the chocolate to uh, keep us in the moment. A little bit of fun. If you can't have chocolate or sugar, there's other things you can use, but it just helps us to, to focus on the moment and where we're at and also gives us a delicious piece of chocolate at the same time. So going back to our keep calm theme, keep calm, Jesus is in the boat. Thank you all so much for joining me and listening in. I do hope it's been of, of some encouragement. Um, thank you for joining me on my boat ride this evening. Jill, you are such a treasure in the kingdom of God. Can we have a rousing hand of applause for our, our guest speaker today? This was incredible. We've got to get you to write a book. we got to get you to write a book. Uh oh. And, uh, we need you to stay muted, everyone. So don't unmute yet. <laughs> We're not done. So we do have an opportunity to interact a little bit with you. And... Um, uh, we just have about 10 minutes, but what we're gonna, I'm going to let Syracuse here manage the chat and the questions, but I do want to say the resources that uh, Jill mentioned, we will immediately after this um, webinar, we will post it on our Instagram and our Facebook accounts, womentoday.international, so you'll see them immediately. And soon we'll edit all this video and we'll have a, uh, a resource on womentoday.international on the website. And all of this material will be there as well. And you can share it then with anybody you like. So we are so grateful to you, Jill. I, uh, while we're waiting for the questions to come in and Sirikit to start, that I just have a quick one for you. You mentioned your infertility. And we've had a lot of questions lately sure. um, to, the, uh, to the women's website just about infertility, that it's, um, it is a real issue for a lot of women in the church. Mm. And, uh, and you've shared so much about dealing with, um, you know, hard times, but maybe if you could just a word or two about what that was like for you and how you, I'm sure it's the same principles you've shared with us yes. already. Thank you so much for yeah. that. We're very richly blessed. Oh, amen. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I talked too long. Um, no, it was great. Are you kidding? Oh, no, I wouldn't change a thing. It was amazing. 
Well, infertility, absolutely. It's a painful, painful topic. Um, I felt a lot of pain. I, um, I actually spoke up about it one time because a day for me that would always be painful every year was Mother's Day. And um, of course, you know, there's so many scriptures that talk about you being blessed to be a mother and this and that. And I thought, well, what if you're not? You know, <laughs> what about us? And um, I, I, I've noted that the church is so much more sensitive now to, to women who don't have children for whatever reason. Maybe, you know, they're still single. Maybe they're infertile. But it, it's something that um, was very personally painful. I, um, I had to wrestle with it with God. This was a whole new thing from Cambodia. And um, I, I had five lots of IVF treatment. The first two were, I got pregnant, I conceived. Um, a particularly challenging time for me was the second pregnancy that I lost. I obviously lost the first one. I then lost the second one. And at that point, I think I dropped very low in my faith. I forgot how God had worked in the past. And mm -hmm. I, I felt, why would a kind and benevolent and loving father allow me to even conceive through IVF only to take it away what what was I supposed to learn there well, I don't get it I, I honestly I got to a point where I thought I don't know if I can be a Christian anymore I I can't even believe I had that thought but I, I I wrestled with it I was wrestling and I I thought you know what I've either got to trust God and I'm going to hang on to God whatever his plan or I have to walk away and of course how could I turn back on Jesus? That's when I went to the cross. I really went back to the cross and thought what Jesus had done for me. It doesn't matter what I go through. Nothing can take me away from the love that Jesus has for me. You know, there's that wonderful scripture, you know, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. And I just decided to cling on. I went through three more IVF treatments after that, all of which failed. And it was a turning point towards my 40th birthday. And I thought we have to draw a line under this um and um, we have to move on and i completely surrendered and i can honestly say i surrendered because we decided to start an overseas adoption program uh, we wanted to adopt from the from cambodia but we couldn't and um because of the corruption there the uk doors were, were shut so we thought we'd adopt try and adopt from the philippines where Ferdy's from that made sense um but um so that, that was the plan and we've been on we were on the adoption program and i discovered i was pregnant naturally but i know i had surrendered because i actually felt mm. disappointment when i found out i was pregnant i sunk my heart to the adoption and, and do you know what i think this is what god's trying to get us to do uh, every trial whatever it is we have to be at that point of surrender i was even thinking about it and praying about it today tammy even small things I realized, wow, yeah, it was when my heart was surrendered that things happened. And, and like I shared, it may not have been something I particularly wanted. It might not have been the dream I had. But hey, what if I'd gone to Africa, which was my dream earlier on? I wouldn't have gone to Cambodia. I wouldn't have met Ferdy, you know, all these things. So I think mm -hmm. God does have a plan. It's just not always what we're looking for. And for some women, you know, I know they will not get pregnant. They, they won't conceive. And, and, and I, you know, and we don't know the answers. It, it's, you know, I, I don't think this side of heaven, we won't really understand all the answers. I can only speak personally from, from what I experienced. And we went, on, we went on later to continue an adoption program um, where, where, of course, we got Jamie and we adopted him. We decided this time to, to do it from out from the UK because we had Maddie by then. By the way, we've been through a lot of challenges with Maddie's health as well. So it wasn't plain sailing, you know, and maybe God was sparing me from something. You know, I think back now on those miscarriages, maybe those children would have been so badly deformed or who knows, but, but maybe he was sparing me from something. Um, but Maddie thankfully came through and, and she's doing well, doing great. But yes, the, when we finally came around to adopt from the UK, little Jamie was in the system. He'd had two previous adoptive families um going to have him and they'd fallen through the the second family had fallen through because they'd been involved in a terrible accident not fatal but bad enough that they'd had to pull out and when our social worker told us about jamie he was so excited and he said we have this little boy he's half cambodian and we we were just amazed, amazed. the Cambodian community amazed. this country is so small 
and you know we felt like wow god wanted us to have this child and then you look back and you think well that's why these things happened at this time because god was timing it that we got jamie i believe i really believe that i was able to meet his birth mother and speak to her in Khmer. Um, you know all, all this time the um social workers had been using um thai translators because that was the nearest language and here was someone who could speak her native tongue it was not not fluently but enough that she she could see my heart for her child and but i loved her country i would always raise jamie knowing about cambodia there's more things from cambodia in our home than the philippines um it's just amazing seeing so i totally believe god has a plan for all those women struggling with infertility i don't know what what it will be but just trust all i can what? say is trust that's so awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Sirikit's feeding us uh, questions. I think we have time for one more. And uh, let me feed this one to you, Jill. It says, uh, what helped with the raw emotions that not only you were dealing with, but also helping others with without getting apathetic or burned out? Compassion fatigue can be a real thing, right? How, how have you in those difficult times and now even um, I, um, do you know what this, this is an interesting one because I, I feel like I deal with this every day with work because as I said mm -hmm. I'm a busy GP it's all about patients coming and needing and wanting and half the time they don't speak my language and having to go through translators it's very hard and there are days when I I get frustrated and impatient and I get back and I pray again but you know what I just think about Jesus you know I love the scriptures where it says early in the morning Jesus went to pray and and what had he been doing the night before healing the sick and um and so I just I just think about his life and and how he loved people I'm a real people person anyway so I you know my heart is naturally to want to help someone um but I yeah I just go back to to Jesus and think of him and pray you know if, if I if I do get impatient or if I do feel like I'm burning out I, I ask for forgiveness and I just focus on what, what I just try to be as best I can the way Jesus was with people and just love them. And I, and I often imagine them. I mean, I've even had some very difficult patients um, for various reasons. Um, and I, I've just sat there quietly before I've called them in and I've, I've said a little prayer and I said, God, help me remember this is your son or this is your daughter. Mm -hmm. You love them and help me love them the way Jesus would if they were coming now to see Jesus. And, of course i'm not jesus and of course <laughs> i'm not going to have the perfect consultation with that particular patient but just trying to think about how would god want me to be in this interaction you know and then we can apply that same thing to, to our friends to people we're reaching out to to people we're studying with you know just trying to have that heart that is so beautiful honestly jill i don't know how to thank you honestly um to everyone who's participated today, I want to thank you. Thank you for putting up with our little technological foibles here. We really appreciate your patience. Thank you for muting your mics. Jill, you were wonderful. This could not have been better. We've got to write this book, though. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a book. It's just amazing. It's so amazing. Honestly, high five and uh, kudos I, to you and thanks for recommending just, you. Yeah, go ahead. So, so, so sorry, Tammy. Um, I was just going to say, there are questions there that surrogates found that, that people would like me to answer. I'm, I'm more than happy if you wanted to forward them to it to me so I could write an email or however it best works. Because I, I, I do appreciate it. I'm so sorry, ladies. I spoke for far too long. and um, you, We needed you to say everything you said. <laughs> it was so good. And we can, let me throw in here, um, actually, Jillian, if you want to throw in the chat um, the women's service team email, it's women's service team there's two s's in there women women's service team at gmail.com if uh if this webinar shuts down and you don't get a chance to get your question in the chat if you want a question we will there you go it's in the chat now our email is there um if you want to send a question to dr jill hall please do please don't hold back we're providing a, a place to connect and we want you to feel that this is our we are a global family yeah absolutely. and so thank you so much yeah oh. thank you so much everyone for participating we've reached the end of our time honestly jill i don't know how to thank you this was oh, so so you. i'm so moved it was so oh. good thank, thank you, you everybody so we love thank you have a great so great day much. take care thank thanks everybody thanks sharon everyone
Bye. Much love. Bye-bye.